Hi friends, Father Kerry Walters here, pastor of Holy Spirit American National Catholic Church. And this is another Holy Spirit moment. This one on a 17th century vision of cosmic harmony, which is still so very relevant today, I think, in the 21st century. In 1642, a smallish book was published in England. It was published anonymously. It bore on the title page a woodcut of a man falling to earth, but caught at the last moment by a heavenly hand. And the epigram for this particular illustration was a coilo salus, saved by heaven. Just a couple of years later, this book was republished, this time with the name of the author. It was Sir Thomas Brown, although he wasn't a sir yet, because this book was written before he was 30 years old. The book Religio Medici is a strange and delightful book. It is written in a style that will just make your mouth water. It is so beautiful. It is a series really of essays on any number of topics that are thinly drawn together under, I suppose you could say, the label religion. But it is much more than that. It is a philosophical investigation of what it is to be a human in the universe made by God. And the centerpiece of that series of essays is Brown's insistence that God saturates the physical world, that the spirit of God is imbued throughout the world in which you and I live. What this little book is often remembered for is its wonderful kind-heartedness, its sense of benevolence, and above all, its toleration of different perspectives, both religious and otherwise. And I hope to help you see by the end of my remarks today, the metaphysical groundwork for that tolerance that Sir Thomas Brown advocates in his classic, classic book, Religio Medici. Uh, he was born in 1605 in London. He studied at Oxford. Uh, he studied medicine uh, on the continent, especially at the University of Padua, which at the time was the primo medical school. Um, and he returned to England, uh, settling eventually in the north, in Norwich, a town that you may know also was the home of that 14th century mystic, Dame Julian of Norwich. He appears to have been a quite skilled physician, um, and in his spare time, he wrote any number of books. Religio Medici was his first one. He starts out by telling the reader, and us today perhaps, um, something that is probably in the back of the mind of anyone who hears the word physician and religion conjoined. Brown assures his readers that even though physicians have a reputation for skepticism or infidelity, he is not one of them. He is indeed very much a religious person. And then he goes on to explain why. Now, before I tell you what he has to say, let me clear up one misunderstanding that is pretty popular in the Brownonian literature. And it is that Brown makes a radical distinction between religion on the one hand and science on the other. He wears two hats, this way of interpreting goes. One is a scientific hat, one is a religious hat, but he never wears them simultaneously. He takes one off in order to put on the other. He keeps the two realms of religion and science completely separate. This, my friends, is nonsense. It's difficult for me to understand how anyone who has actually read Brown's Religio Medici could come to that conclusion. That is an enlightenment understanding of the relationship between religion and science. It is not the Renaissance understanding. And Brown is a Renaissance thinker. So, having cleared that misunderstanding away, we'll see in just a moment that just the opposite is true. Brown tells us that before God created anything, everything that God was to create was an idea in God's mind. And because it was an idea in God's mind, it was absolutely perfect. And those ideas in God's mind are eternal. God doesn't live in sequential linear time like you and I do. God dwells in eternity. 
And so what is in God's mind then and future and now is all merged into one present moment. When God created the physical cosmos, God stamped those ideas upon the physical cosmos. Because the physical cosmos, cosmos is not perfect and cannot be perfect, because only God is perfect, the stamps of those ideas are themselves imperfect. They are reflections, sometimes dim reflections, of the perfect ideas in God's mind. But if we know how to look for them, we can see them shot throughout creation. Put it a different way, God's Spirit is everywhere in creation. The signatures of those divine and perfect ideas that are in God's mind can be discerned everywhere. Let me read you one of the most beautiful passages, I think, in Religio Medici. This is what Sir Thomas Brown has to say. If there be a common nature that unites and ties the scattered and uh, uh, divided individuals into one species, why may there not be one that unites them all? However, I am sure there is a common spirit that plays within us, yet makes no part of us, and that is the spirit of God, the fire and scintillation of that noble and mighty essence, which is the life and radical heat of the world. Whatsoever feels not the warm gale and gentle ventilation of this spirit, I dare not say he lives. So this scintillating spirit permeates throughout the physical cosmos. That's the first step in understanding what Sir Thomas Brown means by cosmic harmony. It's not just a metaphysical assertion on his part. As a physician, he is an empirical observer. He is a man who trusts his experience of the physical world. And he seems to think that he sees this cosmic harmony, this, these signatures of God everywhere. So, for instance, he believes that he discerns them in the phenomenon of human consciousness. There is no organ in the body, says this man who has dissected many, many bodies, that can account for consciousness. It must be a reflection of spirit, of the divine ideas. Or he looks at the world around him and the body of human beings and creatures, for that matter, and he sees symmetry everywhere. Symmetry must likewise be a reflection of the perfection in God's mind. And he has several more specific examples. One of them is really quite delightful and has often been quoted. He was a bit of an amateur chemist and he was fascinated by mercury. And he observed that he can divide mercury into any number of different blobs, as it were, and then he can put them back together and they will resume the original shape that all of them were pulled from. And he sees this as a signature of the perfect idea in God's mind of the dissolution, but also the resurrection of human bodies on the final day of judgment. We may think that that's a quaint example, but it is a telling one that illustrates Brown's insistence that from empirical observation, the uh, presence of spirit in the world can be divined. He also wants to argue that the cosmic harmony that is guaranteed by the presence of spirit in the world can be thought of as a great scale of being, a great chain of being. This isn't an idea that's unique to Brown, but it certainly is one that he embraces. It goes all the way back to the Middle Ages. The notion of the um, great chain of being or scale of being has it that everything which exists in the universe is in a hierarchical order, with God being at the very top of the chain and the, the simplest kinds of created things being at the bottom and everything else in between. This great chain of being is another way of talking about the harmony of existence because everything has its designated place in the great scale or chain of being. Harmony can ensue. He also says something else that's really quite fascinating. He says that human beings are wondrous amphibians. Centuries later, C.S. Lewis, in his wonderful little book, The Screw Tape Letters, will say the same thing, that human beings are amphibians with one foot in heaven and one foot on the earth. And I can't help but think that Lewis, who knew his 17th century British literature, borrowed this image from Thomas Brown. 
Human beings are amphibians because their location on the great chain of being means that they are imbued in a conscious way with divine spirit, but they are also material beings. Now, of course, everything that is is imbued with divine spirit, but humans are the epitome of that uh, sh uh, sharing of divine spirit because we are conscious of possessing it, or at least we're capable of being conscious of possessing it. And what that means, he says, is that human beings are, in addition to being amphibious creatures, we are microcosmic creatures. We are a small universe which reflects the greater universe. And the reason for that, once again, is because we are composites of spirit and matter, as is the entire physical and spiritual order. There's no distinction to be made here between spirit and matter if you think that they belong to completely separate realms. They do not. The one somehow infiltrates the other. And by the way, the understanding of human beings as microcosms, once again, is not unique to Brown, although the way in which he expresses it is really quite beautiful. This notion of human beings as microcosms was also uttered by his um, older contemporary, the poet John Donne, in one of his holy sonnets, sonnet number five, in which Donne says that I am a world, a little world cunningly made. I am a microcosm. When God looks at the universe in which God has infiltrated God's self, God sees only the great perfect ideas which are in God's mind. When God looks at you and me, says Brown, God doesn't see our foibles, our sins, our weaknesses. God sees what Brown calls the epitome of us, the perfect model of us, the original perfect idea of us in God's mind that still dwells in God's mind. When you and I look at the world around us, and especially when we look at other people, we should do our best to discern as close as we can that perfection that God sees. We should try to be as kind as we can to one another, to as forbearing as we can to one another by looking beneath the surface and trying to intuit the perfect idea which each and every one of us are signatories of. And if we do that, and this takes us back to the toleration that the Religio Medici is so in, um, uh, celebrates. If we do that, we are likely to be much more tolerant of one another because we will recognize that we all share in common this idea in God's mind of perfect humanity, that we are all equally imbued with divine spirit, that we are all equally loved by the Creator who imbues us with his spirit. Religio Medici, my friends, has so much more to offer than what I've given you here today. But this is the centerpiece, I believe, the key to understanding all of the musings and reflections that Brown offers us in this incredible, incredible little book. I may well indeed do another Holy Spirit moment on another aspect of Religio Medici in the future. It is just that rich. But in the meantime, I really do encourage you to pick up a copy. It's less than 100 pages. You can easily find a free online copy. Sir Thomas Brown's Religio Medici. I'm Father Kerry Walters, and this has been another Holy Spirit moment. Thank you so much for watching. If you are of a mind, I invite you to subscribe to this YouTube channel. But whether you do or not, I'll see you next time. God bless. Take care.